let's make a bet, okay? Imagine I have four dice here in my hand, okay? I will give you 10 euros if you get at least one six. But if there are no sixes, then you will give me 10 euros. Is that a good bet? Is that a profitable bet? And what does profitable mean? These and other similar mathematical problems were the core of a discussion that a French mathematician, Blaise Pascal, had with a known gambler on one side and with another mathematician, Pierre de Fermat, on the other side in the middle of the 17th century. They were trying to understand whether or not it is possible to know in advance if a given bet is profitable for the gambler. That's how the theory of probability was born, out of gambling. Of course, they were driven by scientific curiosity, but basically, they just wanted to make money. We are a pop science company, and our aim is to take mathematics, the most hated school subject, <laughs> yes, I know, you know, <laughs> and try to, to find a way to make people fall in love or fall in love again with it. Um, with this idea, we started with a project. Our aim was to use gambling as a tool to talk about probability. We used gambling as a tool to talk about uh, probability. Why? Because quite a few people hate mathematics, but they love gambling, maybe. That's the idea. So we decided to build a mathematical casino, and we bought a roulette table, a blackjack table, and a poker table. And we borrowed the free work in the slot machines. We set up a traveling exhibition in which people can bet their money while we keep track of all the money they bet, all the money they win, and all the money they lose. This is to prove that the theory of, probab of probability allows us to foresee how things will turn out for the gambler, that is, how much money will be lost. We started out with this pop science project that used gambling as a way to talk about probability, but with the passing of time, our initial project turned into something different. It turned into a prevention project. Today, we use probability as a tool to talk about gambling and gambling-related risks. And we do that in partnership with our uh, national health system. Uh, even more so, we think that probability can help people make better economic decisions. And that's the idea we would like to discuss with you today. How can we use mathematics to explore gambling and gambling-related risks? trying to unveil the mathematical design that stands behind each gamble. The core of this design is the following. Gamblers will lose in the long run. There's nothing they can do, neither luck nor skill can help them. Of course, you can win once, but in the long run, there's nothing you can do. The more you bet, the more you lose. Another crucial part of the design is having the right mix of mathematical and psychological ingredients in order to capture gamblers and keep them hooked, even when they realize that they are losing a lot of money. One of these ingredients is called the near miss. Look at that. That's a near miss. It generates a lot of frustration, as you see in Paolo, together <laughs> with a strong desire to try again, immediately. In slot machine and stretch curves, this is artificially recreated by their designers. When gamblers lose, they often have the perception of having nearly won. Like in this stretch curve, where we see a 33, we win a 500 heroes, but it turns out that we don't have it, but we have a 31 and a 32. That's not bad luck. That's gambling design. Game designers have another powerful uh, tool. Uh, if uh, uh, gamblers buy 10 scratch cards and they lose 10 times in a row, they will probably give up gambling. Uh, that means they have to win frequently, so win frequently. It doesn't matter how much, a uh, very small amount of money may be sufficient. That's why in our Italian most famous scratch card, uh, you win one prize every four tickets, that's a lot, but every ten winning tickets, eight contain a five euro prize that is the ticket price. Uh, 
or a 10 euro prize, and if you win such a small amount of money, you do not go home with that, but you immediately reinvest what you've just won. Last but not least, top prize needs to be really appealing. No matter how unlikely, because it makes no real difference to us. However, Italian lottery top prize, for, for example, is usually worth several tens of millions of euros because winning holds are very, very low. One chance out of 622,640,630. That's really unlikely to happen, but we are numb to such a low probability. You should know that on the 12th of April 2068, there's a chance that asteroid 99942 Apophis hit the Earth. And if that happens, the energy released by the impact should be that of nearly 90,000 nuclear bombs. That might be a bad moment for our planet. Yes, of course. And, and, and NASA has calculated that there's one chance out of 150,000 for this to happen. That is 4,000 times more likely than winning the lottery. This example might help us understand how unlikely we winning the lottery is, but it's not enough. Because we see lots of people winning the lottery, but we have never heard of the Earth being destroyed by an asteroid. And the result is that we are not worried by humankind extinction in 2068, but we hope to win the lottery. That's why we make a huge simplification in our lives we think that events are either, either possible or impossible, and that's correct. But when we say possible, we actually mean it may happen to me, and that's not completely correct. Let's make it clear. Another French mathematician, his name was Emile Borel, at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, said that things can be possible. That is, they can actually happen to me impossible, that is, they can't happen at all. And then there's a third category in the middle that we could call practically impossible, that is theoretically possible, but practically impossible. Let us give you two examples of practical impossible events. March the 24th, 2001, Randy Johnson, Arizona Diamondbacks baseball player, is going to throw the ball. Randy is one of the most famous American pitchers known for his over 4,000 strikeouts and for being the oldest pitcher to throw a perfect game. But if you look for him on the web, you'll find he's really famous for what happened that day. Be careful, because the video is very quick. Already happened, let's see it again. Uh, Randy Johnson throws the ball at over 100 kilometers per hour and hits a dove that was flying over the field at that exact moment. Let's see it again. It really happened. Randy Johnson uh, throws the ball and hits the, a dove and the, <laughs> the nearly explodes, leaving a handful of feathers on the, on the field. Randy Johnson retired from professional uh, <laughs> <laughs> the doves uh, died. Uh, Randy Johnson retired from professional baseball. He's now a professional photographer. Look at his company logo. This is his company logo. <laughs> yes, that's, that's, I swear, it's true. And what happened to Randy Johnson is practically impossible, meaning that it's so unlikely to happen that we should not think it will happen to, to you, even if you've just seen it happen to him. And here is the second example. Roy Sullivan is an American park ranger born in 1912 and died in 1983. You'll probably will not believe to what you are going to hear, but we can assure you that everything really did happen. Yes. In 1942, Roy was 30 years old when he was hiding in a fire lookout tower that was hit by several lightning bolts. The tower caught fire, Roy got out of it, and seconds later got hit by a lightning bolt. But he didn't die. Nothing strange so far. 
27 years later, 1969, Roy Sullivan was 57, he was driving a truck on a mountain road when a lightning bolt hit the tree, not the truck, a tree next to the truck. Uh, the bolt then bounced and passed through the open window of the truck and hit Roy Sullivan for the second time. Roy Sullivan got hit by lightning, uh, but didn't die once again. The following year, 1970, Roy got hit by his third lightning bolt. He was standing at the edge of his garden when he was hit by a lightning bolt, but even this time, he didn't die. In 1972, he got hit by his fourth lightning bolt, but didn't die. But this time, he became famous. In an in <laughs> yes, of course. In an interview, he declared, uh, I can be standing in a crowd of people, but it will hit me. <laughs> yes, he said so. <laughs> In another one, he said, um, uh, I've never been a fearful man, but I have to tell you the truth. When I hear it thunder now, I feel a little shaky. That's what... <laughs> <laughs> in that very year, 1972, uh, he entered the Guinness Book of World Records as the only living man to be struck four times by lightning. 1973. Roy was patrolling the park when he saw a cloud in the distance. <laughs> <laughs> he hid inside the truck, <laughs> and when he felt safe, he left the truck and he got hit <laughs> by a lightning. It was his fifth lightning bolt, but even this time, he didn't, he didn't die. And in an interview, he declared, the cloud seemed to be following me. In uh, 1976, he was once again patrolling the park. He saw a cloud in the distance, but this time he was together with a colleague. The colleague saw the cloud. He realized he was together with Roy Sullivan and ran in the opposite direction. <laughs> That's all. Uh, Roy Sullivan ran to a lightning ball, chose, of course, Roy Sullivan, <laughs> and hit him for the sixth time, but even this time he didn't die. In 1977, Roy was fishing when he was hit by his seventh lightning bolt. Some people are allergic to flowers, but I'm allergic to lightning, he declared, because even this time he didn't die. Roy Sullivan died, finally. <laughs> <laughs> On the 28th of September 2018, no, 1983, uh, he killed himself. He killed himself with a gunshot because of an unrequited love at the age of, 20, of 71. What happened to Roy is practically impossible, meaning that it's so unlikely to happen that you should not believe it will happen to you, even if you have seen it happen to somebody else. And that's how we should look at lotteries. Winning the lottery is practically impossible, meaning that someone wins, but this does not mean that you are going to win. We think uh, that talking about gambling from a mathematical point of view can be uh, really helpful to make people more aware about gambling mechanisms and gambling-related risks, and maybe make people fall in love with math again. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Grazie.